Okay, so why don't we get started, everyone? So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thanks so much for finding the time to be with us here today. It's a great day at SOA Software. My name is Simon Barrer, Director of Technology here at SOA Software, based out of Los Angeles, our uh, headquarters. And uh, I want to talk with you today about a very exciting topic. The uh, webinar is entitled Realizing SOA and API Convergence for IBM Data Power Customers. And we're going to go into some nice detail about uh, the convergence of SOA and API technology, why it's such an important topic, what it means for IBM customers and especially data power customers, and what you can do to realize and achieve convergence of SOA and API technology into the future. So we have about an hour uh, to go through a very important topic, and uh, we're very excited about presenting this information to you. As we go through uh, today's hour, just a couple of quick notes. If you could please mute your line as we go through this, that, that will create a nice environment for everyone with no background noise. At the same time, let's also keep things interactive. So anytime during the presentation, if you have any thoughts or questions, please just blurt it out. Uh, and obviously unmute your line, uh, and uh, we'll have a great conversation. You can also use the WebEx chat. So have, hopefully everyone's dialed into the WebEx, and you can actually see uh, my screen, which should have the uh, opening page of a slide deck. And in that WebEx, there's a chat window where you can um, raise questions. You can um, direct a question to myself, Simon Barrer, or to everyone, whatever you choose. But essentially, you can just ask questions, and we will uh, take them as they come. Um, so with that, um, why don't we dive in and talk a little bit about uh, today's agenda, and uh, then we'll actually dive into the content. So uh, agenda-wise, we're going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about SOA software, who we are, what we do, and then we're going to go through a couple of slides on what API and SOA convergence is and how you realize convergence uh, on the IBM platform using data power. But then the bulk of today is actually going to be a live demo where we show real working code. So we're actually going to show you some real convergence use cases in action for some you know, very sophisticated uh, things that we're going to do. And then we'll close things out with uh, Q&A uh, and answer all your questions and, and uh, any closing uh, thoughts or comments. Okay? So that's essentially our agenda for today's webinar. So why don't we dive in and just talk quickly about uh, SOA software. So SOA software is an enterprise software company, again, based out of uh, Los Angeles. We are a IBM business partner. We do a lot of great work with IBM and with uh, the IBM customer base. We have, uh, actually have a very long history of providing API and SOA solutions within IBM enterprise environments. We work with a lot of sophisticated IBM uh, um, scenarios. We work with products like Webster Data Power, which is a key role in today's session. We also work with products like IBM Integration Bus, Webster MQ, a lot of integration work with systems e mainframes and so on. So we do a lot of great work helping IBM customers to realize the very best of API and SOA in their environments. And one of the things that we uh, offer that's very unique uh, to SOA software is a unified API and SOA platform. So we can offer a single platform for both API and SOA that includes full lifecycle management and integrated runtime support so that you know that from soup to nuts, you're going to be able to plan and, and design and build and run and share all of your services in a very seamless way, very fully automated way. So a very, very nice solution. And you're gonna learn a lot about that today in terms of uh, what we bring to the table and how we can help you in your environment. So that gives you just a quick idea about SOA software. One other quick note about us is just wanted to mention that in 2013, Gartner gave us very nice recognition for the hard work that we do in the API and SOA space. Gartner uh, gave us the best vision for API management and best vision for SOA uh, governance in an um, analysis uh, and paper called Application Services Governance, which is Gartner's sort of terminology for the convergence of API and SOA technology into the future. So we're very happy with that outcome from Gartner. It represents the outcome of a lot of uh, years of very hard work and, and a lot of thinking about uh, what makes sense for customers out there who are trying to tackle the challenges in their, in their environments for both SOA and API. So we were definitely very happy um, with, uh, with uh, Gartner's announcement there. And just another quick note before we dive into uh, convergence, there are some good resources that you can pursue uh, after today's session. We have a really nice white paper, SOA and API convergence, what it means for IBM customers. You can think of that as a companion piece to today's webinar. You can see the bit.ly link there, uh, links to an SOA.com page where you can download that white paper. We also have a great web webinar um, for uh, data power 
called Turbocharged Data Power to Reach Your SOA Goals. You can see, also see the bit.ly link there as well. That's an earlier webinar that we put out that goes into a lot of great detail about some of the work that we do on data power, especially from an SOA standpoint. So today we're talking about SOA, API, and convergence, but that webinar did a nice job of talking about SOA. So definitely do check that out. I think that's about an hour long as well, and it'll give you a lot of great ideas about um, what we can do for you and uh, in your data power environments uh, for SOA. A couple of other resources. We have another nice webinar, API and SOA, two sides of the same coin. Another bit.ly link over there that you can go to uh, view that recorded webinar, and yet another one, our APIs and SOA converging, and you can see the bit.ly link down there as well. So a lot of great content at SOA.com talking about convergence and talking about what's important for you moving into the future. So definitely recommend that after today's webinar, you check out all this material, and uh, you can learn a lot from a lot of the stuff that we've put out um, in the past. Okay? So. With that, um, why don't we dive in, and I wanted to share with you just a couple of slides and ideas about API and SOA and convergence and kind of level set with you how we think about it and why we feel that it's so important and why it's so important to start thinking about this in your own environments. So I think you know most of you, if not all of you, are aware of SOA and API. Many of you are even um, uh, going uh, through initiatives. Uh, for SOA and API, or maybe you've been doing it for years. So I think that there's some, some good um, sort of ideas uh, among the industry overall about what these technologies are. This slide talks a little bit about some of the key attributes of SOA technology and API technology. On the left-hand side here in blue, you can see some of the key attributes for SOA, things like a uh, focus on internal use and business partner use. There's a lot of strictness to SOA. It really wants to get things right in terms of uh, data models and interfaces and procedures and, and processes. Um, also works with a lot of key uh, technology like SOAP and WSecurity and SAML and so on. So SOA has a lot of very important attributes, and these attributes have been used by a lot of folks. I'm sure many of you have, have already have successes within the SOA space in a way that you can take your existing environments that are you know, very, very uh, rich and robust and, and, um, and, and turn those into an environment that's very service-oriented where you can expose all of your different resources using all that technology that you use inside the data center. If we switch over to API technology, which you see there in, in, in green on the right, you can see some of the, the key attributes of API technology. So whereas SOA is typically internal, API is typically external. It doesn't have to be, but that's definitely a huge use case for API. Uh, things like um, structure and definition is still sort of being worked out. Process and procedure is not always the centerpiece. It's often about just quickly getting things out in order to uh, drive uh, business initiatives. It's often very externally hosted in order to support a lot of those external use cases. And it uses different types of technology as um, SOA, things like REST and basic auth, OAuth and JSON technology and, and so on. So a lot of very important um, uh, attributes for APIs. So that kind of gives you an idea of some of the key things that you would attach to API technology and SOA technology. But the question is, is what the heck does that have to do with convergence? So what? So SOA has a bunch of attributes. API has a bunch of attributes. What does that all mean in the big picture? You can see on this slide what that means and why it's so important. If you kind of summarize what you uh, think about when you think about API and think about SOA, when it comes to API, you think a lot about consumption. Really what's at the name of the game for API is the ability to make your enterprise data very easily consumable. Uh, to a very large community. And this could uh, be uh, web-based applications, this could be mobile apps, these could be mobile developers, these could be very large types of solutions that folks are building or very small solutions. They could be solutions that are directly tied to your organization or they can be entirely external or a third party to your organization. But the name of the game is consumption. How do you very easily announce to the world that you have a bunch of uh, very useful enterprise data and that it's very easy for folks to consume and that you want to give access to the right folks so that they can actually consume it and uh, do a great job of making your data available to whoever it may be, typically and cons uh, customers and consumers of your business, but it could be essentially for any use that, that's important. Okay, So consumption is the name of the game for API. How about SOA? What does this mean for SOA and why is SOA in the picture at all? Well, when you talk, think about SOA, SOA technology focuses on the production of enterprise resources. So you have this, these very typically large and complex IBM backends, lots of MQ messaging and Web3 application server, lots of mainframe uh, programs and other important things in the backend. The question is, is how do you actually take all that data and produce it in a way that it's available for consumption? And again, you can see some of the bullet points here of what's so important for SOA. A lot of enterprise level things, integration and security, standardization, the ability to drive a service lifecycle across many different groups and organizations, 
IT reuse has always been a cornerstone of SOA technology. Reliability and the ability to have a, a highly available uh, data center that can actually support whatever traffic loads are needed any time of the day, any day of the week, any, any uh, uh, time of the year. So SOA has that very, very important focus around production. And the key piece here is that, you know, you really can't have consumption without production. And in many respects, you can't really have production without consumption. And so that's why we think of the two as two sides of the same coin, right? If you have a great way to make everyone aware of all the great data that you have, but you can't actually make that data available, then trying to make it, make it available for consumption is really not uh, going to work out very well. So definitely the production side is so, so important. On the flip side, if you're able to uh, have a really nice, well-organized environment that can very easily make all this data available for consumption, but you have no tools to actually get people to realize that the data is available and to understand how to actually consume it, then all of that is for naught, okay? So when we think about API and SOA, we think about it in terms of consumption and production, and we think about it in a way that if you don't have both together, you're going to run into trouble. So the question is, is if you only spend a lot of your time today coming out with API-based solutions, are you going to be okay? Is that acceptable? And the answer is not really. You're going to run into a lot of problems. Perhaps up front in your initial implementations and initiatives, you're going to be able to make some headway. You're going to be able to build some community of mobile developers and cloud developers and internal web developers and business partners. You're going to be able to make some progress. But over time, if your goal is to take all of your enterprise data that needs to be exposed and get it out there, you're talking about a massive effort. And if you don't have the right tools, if you don't have a proper SOA in place to actually do that, you're definitely going to run into a lot of very strategic issues that's going to stop you from reaching all the goals that you need to reach. Okay? So that gives you some ideas about what we mean when we talk about convergence. And from our standpoint, it's inevitable that API and SOA will converge into the future. So that begs the question, what model should you follow to ensure that as API and SOA converge more and more into the future, you're going to be able to take advantage of it. And that's exactly what the next couple of slides are about. We talk about in the white paper that I mentioned earlier, three different models of convergence. We talk about model A, model B, and model C. And you can see model A and B on this slide over here. In model A, essentially we keep consumption and production separate, and they sort of grow over time independently. And where there are associations across them, we have just a bit of ad hoc integration across the two. Okay? So essentially independent um, uh, growth of both consumption and production with whatever ad hoc tooling is needed to make the two work. Okay? From a convergence model B standpoint, we have consumption and production where consumption grows over time. So you're spending a lot of time making the whole world aware of all the great data that you have but you're not investing in production, and production is shrinking, so you're not ensuring that it's all the new data and applications that come out internally come out that you don't have a real program in place to make sure that those are all done according to standards and in a way that's very easily uh, consumable by whoever needs to consume it. Okay? So that's Model A and Model B, and both Model A and Model B have some significant risks associated with them, right? So you can kind of see a listing out here of some of the key risks. You have a lot of, um, with Model A, you have a lot of uh, cost and, and overlap and confusion trying to run multiple solutions and, and, and multiple runtime gateways at the same time. You essentially have two different um, uh, um, solutions that you need to kind of manage separately, but they have uh, pieces that are in common. You try and figure out how to make that work. You have a lot of trouble with that. You also tend to lose either consumption capabilities or production capabilities. So one way or another, you don't have all the functionality you need to both get this data out there and also make it very easy for folks to consume so that you can properly market that data and make sure that it's satisfying all the different needs of the business. Okay? Of course, with Model A, if you look at the third bullet uh, in the middle here, slow, ongoing, and expensive ad hoc integrations. So you definitely don't want to be in a situation where every time some new functionality is needed, you need to spin up a new, pro a new project that takes into account what kind of stuff you're trying to get from your back end, what kind of stuff you're trying to get out to your consumers, how you can make those pieces work together. So definitely that's not something that you're going to want to um, deal with every time you have new functionality into the future. Okay? And perhaps one last piece here is lack of access to critical back end enterprise data. Sort of talked about that earlier. Supposing you spend a lot of time making sure that all of your uh, data is available through APIs out, uh, out on the cloud, out to mobile, but it doesn't actually interconnect. You're having such a hard time getting to that data and making it available to these folks. Essentially, they're going to lack the data they need. They won't be able to build the next generation apps that they need. They won't be able to build the next generation digital marketing channels that are needed to make your organization uh, the, the top tier in your space. 
So you're going to run into a lot of issues there as well. So definitely A and B are big issues. But that begs the question, what type of a convergence model does work? What kind of a convergence model uh, will give you everything that you need to ensure that you have the functionality into the future? And that brings us to uh, uh, the Model C. So you can see what Model C looks like over here, and this is a true convergence model. You can see on the left-hand side that we're talking about consumption and production to get together. Production might be a little bit bigger today because that's, uh, you guys have typically been spending more of your time on production uh, in the past. Consumption is a bit of a new topic around API, but essentially you have production and consumption, and they are together, okay? Two sides of the same coin, blue and green are overlapping. And then as consumption and production grow, the overlap gets greater and greater. Okay, so as you have great new uh, features and capabilities for consumption, you also have it for production. The two match each other directly because you have a unified solution. And you can see what this leads to over the long term in red, you can see you have a single unified consumption and production story where everything you're doing on production uh, can be mapped to consumption. Everything you're doing on consumption can be mapped to production and you're able to solve all your critical issues both from an IT standpoint and from a business standpoint. So essentially, Convergence Model C is the model that you guys want to think about into the future as you think about making progress in both your API environment and your SOA environment and program. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense uh, in terms of convergence. Any thoughts or questions on that so far in terms of everything we said about convergence and, and different models? Okay, great. So let's keep on going. So now that you understand what convergence is all about, why it's so important, and some different models of pursuing it, it begs the question, how can you actually realize convergence model C? So glad you asked. And this is a key part of today's topic because we're talking about how you can use IBM data power in order to enable SOA and API convergence into the future. And you can do this through a partnership with SOA software where we can actually uh, bring out the right level of features in a fully unified solution for both SOA and API. You can kind of see what we're doing here on this slide. We have a variety of different key functional areas. On the bottom, you can see their lifecycle management and our lifecycle manager product. You can also see the runtime aspect from a gateway standpoint. We talk about gateway services and service integration. And from a uh, analytics and developer engagement and the ability to market and publish and make available to a large community, all of your different APIs, we have Community Manager. So essentially, all of these products work together in one single unified solution to give you everything that you need from both an SOA services standpoint and an API standpoint, and both a production standpoint and a consumption standpoint. So essentially, this is our recommendation, this is our proposal to you in terms of how you can bring API and SOA convergence to your IBM environment, and how you can leverage data power to do that, and we're actually going to see some real working code a little bit later on how data power is actually going to enable uh, this type of functionality out in your environment, okay? To give you an idea of the different roles here, pretty much went, went through this on the last slide, but you can see kind of in, a, in different guise the different um, uh, features that, that, that are brought to the table. So again, lifecycle manager, community manager, also policy manager for data power and data power coming together to offer this fully unified solution. You can see on the bottom the key things that data power brings Table. Data Power is an extremely powerful appliance and is very well suited for both API and SOA workloads, right? It's also very well suited for leveraging the entire enterprise platform. It has an amazing integration with so many different IBM uh, products and, and platforms, and it also allows you to work with the infrastructure that you have today. So if you're an existing Data Power customer and you have a very large, nice environment that you've made a lot of great progress on, then keep it. Keep working with that environment add this great SOA and API features to that environment, but still leverage all the power of the data power platform without having to worry about adopting some other gateway platform out there just to run your APIs or just to do something else. You want a unified platform, and IBM Data Power can give that to you. IBM Data Power can give you all the features you want to do all of your API use cases and all of your SOA use cases, all of your security use cases, mediation use cases, your ESB and your security gateway use cases, all the things that you need to do can be done on data power. And that's why we like using data power so much when we talk about this fully managed, full lifecycle solution utilizing products like Lifecycle Manager, Community Manager, and Policy Manager for data power. Okay? Perhaps one last slide, and we will um, take a look at our actual demo. And this is kind of a, a bit of an architecture diagram that shows you what your environment could look like with this partnership between SOA Software and IBM Web Store Data Power. You can see, of course, in the center of all this is Data Power. Data Power is providing that key 
runtime infrastructure, that key API and SOA gateway is going to give you all the features you need to run your entire business. And you can see what the back end looks like there. You have IBM mainframes, you have IBM integration bus, plus your application server, you also have web queue and a whole host of IBM products. You may have non-IBM things here as well. You may have a wide array of different backend systems. Data Power can handle all of that uh, and more. So your backend is very, very rich and fully managed by SOA software and Data Power. And you can see what's actually running in Data Power. We have some SOAP services that are used for trading partners. We have some internal services that are used uh, for, let's say, portals and internal web applications and call centers and whatever that may be. But we also have in the bottom left there mobile APIs. So this is the key part where Data Power is offering you the best of, of all worlds. With mobile APIs, you can see that on the left there you have iPhone and Windows and Android that are all taking advantage of Data Power and this rich enterprise integration with your backend in order that your mobile users can have the same great experience as your internal staff and your trading partners and everyone else who's using all this great rich enterprise data. And of course, in red, you can see how SOA software is managing this picture. At the top, you have service lifecycle management through Lifecycle Manager. So we are giving you the tools to control and manage and drive the full lifecycle of your SOA services and your API services from start all the way to finish. And it's in a fully automated environment, an extremely robust environment where you can define exactly what your service lifecycle needs to be, who needs to be involved in that service lifecycle, what are all the key decision points and the key getting points. So that life cycle is definitely a very key aspect of this whole picture. But you can also see right under Life Cycle Manager, Policy Manager offering that runtime registry support. That's giving you everything you need to make sure that Data Power has the correct model and you have a fully automated experience where you can come out with hundreds or even thousands of different uh, APIs and SOA services and they can all automatically be deployed and run on Data Power. And then finally, you can see on the bottom, Community Manager, giving you an API developer portal, and that's what, how you're going to actually build a community of um, app developers, mobile app developers, and API developers who can get together and they can share, and the developers can help each other to learn how to use all this rich enterprise data, figure out the right uh, protocols and technologies, and deal with uh, legal issues and, and uh, documentation, everything that's needed essentially in order to run a full community. But that full community is fully integrated with everything else. So it fully runs on top of data power, fully leverages the life cycle of your services. So all told, this hopefully to you is a very, very attractive picture, very, very nice picture of how things could look in the future and how you can make progress on all aspects of SOA and API in one single fully unified uh, solution that has data power at its core, offering you those runtime services, offering that, you that very powerful security gateway, API, SOA gateway, in order to run all of your business transactions. Okay, so that's pretty much what I wanted to share in terms of the backdrop for convergence, and we're going to move into a demo and actually show you some real working code. Before we do that, any thoughts or questions on anything that we've gone over so far? Uh, in terms of data power and convergence and uh, being able to come out with a solution that um, anticipates the needs of API and SOA convergence? Uh, Simon, there's two questions on chat for you. Yes, I do see that. So let me actually address the questions in the chat. The first question is, is, is the runtime registry in the slide same as WSRR? It's a great question. That's a question about the uh, uh, WebSphere uh, service registry and repository product. So it's not the same. Um, if you take a look at the total picture, there is some functionality uh, scattered, for example, in the current picture that we're looking at here that's related to WSRR. WSRR will give you some uh, lifecycle uh, uh, features around your APIs and the ability to uh, come out with a service catalog. But no, I would say that the slide that you see here is not one and the same as um, WSRR. Uh, next question is, is um, what does integration bus offer in terms of integration patterns, volume, speed, et cetera? So one of the patterns that we see with integration bus is a lot of customers like to have data power in front of integration bus, integration bus having a lot of the very robust and very sophisticated flows that are used to integrate with a larger organization, could be Webster MQ, could be Webster Application Server, and so on. And data power provides that very high speed security gateway and offers a lot of that API and SOA functionality. So just to throw out one idea there, data power can very nicely limit traffic, something that IBM integration bus would not be used for. So let's say you have a consumer who's just pounding the data center with traffic and it's just going too much. You want to protect integration bus, right? 
So typically what we see is that integration bus and data power work very nicely together. We have a lot of uh, great customer stories about that partnership where data power can provide all that SOA and API functionality. Integration bus can provide all those um, great uh, backend integration and, and, and integration flows. Next question, how does this compare with uh, IBM API, man API management solution? Is it complementary? Um, also built on top of data power. So that's a great, great, great question and great point. So IBM API management is a little bit different from what you're seeing over here. So one of the key things about this solution that you're seeing here is that it's built for the data power platform. So I would say that's one uh, large difference in the sense that everything that we do in terms of services on data power is intended to replicate how you guys use data power today. Right? So it's not just about APIs and it's not just about a, a narrower set of functionality. We're actually giving you the full data power experience, allowing you to do all the great things that you're doing today, leverage the entire appliance, use things like Webster MQ and mainframe integration, mediation, ESB support, security gateway support, and so on. So that's one key area. Another key area that I would mention is probably around lifecycle management. So that goes back to the top part of the slide. So the ability to actually drive a full SOA and API lifecycle across your services is something that's a little bit different. And probably another thing as well is also, again, focus on convergence. So um, we talk about both SOA and API here. So you'll be able to continue with all of your internal SOA use cases. You'll also be able to make progress with API in the future as well. Um, so great question. Um, next question in the uh, WebEx, what version of appliance are we talking about? Do we need API Manager from IBM? Another good question. So this would essentially be the latest uh, release of data power. So this would be data power six going into data power seven. Um, and no, you don't need other products. Essentially, it, the focus is on the data power platform. So it's SOA software partnering with data power uh, out of box in order to give you all the features that we're talking about. So great, great question there. Um, next question, what's the role of policy manager when data power can provide the SLA and, and policy management? Another really good question. So remember that in this partnership between SOA software and data power, Data Power still provides all that runtime capability. What we are offering is a management layer and an automation layer. So if you're already using things today like SLM policy or AAA policy or a variety of MQ features and functions, you're still using all those features and functions. It's just that they're fully managed now. So now you're able to build a model of your SOA and your API infrastructure, and you're able to uh, use very simple terms to do so and then we're able to deploy that to data power and make use of data power's features in order to do that, okay? So that's a great question. We don't change data power. We don't uh, add sort of uh, new, new things. We add the, the API and SOA features and functions that are needed, utilizing data power's feature set, but in a fully uh, managed and automated um, environment. Um, next question, um, does uh, data power work with ESBs provided by other vendors? So the work with uh, other ESBs is as per data power's uh, functionality. So if today you are using data power with other ESBs, for example, even integration bus, um, that is still possible. So we don't uh, change that or limit that. Whatever uh, IBM supports and recommends today for other ESBs, uh, you can support in this picture as well. Um, next question is um, that uh, you might have fewer APIs compared to SOA services. So um, because I can't quite read the question, consumption will be smaller. So yes, absolutely. Out the gate, if you have smaller uh, API presence than SOA, then it'll be smaller to start with, and it will grow however it will grow. If you have 100 APIs today, but 1,000 SOA services, that's fine. If you have three APIs and 40 SOA services, that's fine, and that will all grow. The picture you're seeing on the slide here can anticipate any kind of growth in any area. So we scale very nicely across a wide variety of different use cases. You don't need to worry about what you're doing today. Whatever you're doing today, we can support, and whatever you need to do in the future, we can also um, support. All right, next question. Um, what component in this chart drives enterprise data flow? So another great, great question. It's always data power, right? Data power is the SOA and API gateway in this picture. It is the one that manages all of your transactions. It's no different than your experience today. So whereas today you use data power to accept all kinds of traffic and do all kinds of great work with it, it will continue to do that, and that's why you see data power in the center of the slide. Okay. Next question, does it work with both physical and virtual data power form factor? Is another good question. We absolutely support both. So whether you're working with the data power virtual edition or with physical appliances, we can support it. We also work with the uh, uh, full range of data power models, so X245, X52, X62, and so on. So we can support uh, your entire data power infrastructure. Um, Next question, is data power a software as a service? So another good question. In this model you're seeing here, it's not software as a service. It's essentially on-premise. 
and uh, you're running it in your data center, similar to how you're running data power today. Um, and last question, okay. finally. Um, SOI Software Africa Component Work can work as a standalone API management solution without data power. Great question. We actually do. So our solution set works with a wide variety of different platforms. Data power is one key platform, but there are different um, platforms that you can work with. Um, so let's definitely talk later and share with you more information about um, anything, for example, if you're doing things on a non-IBM uh, platform. So great questions. Glad that we um, were able to cover all of them. Let's keep the questions um, coming. But for now, what I'd love to do is to switch over to our um, demo and actually show you some real working code. And actually, a lot of these questions, not all of them, but a lot of them we're actually going to be able to answer because you're going to see some real working code and real, real product that's going to help you to understand exactly how things work. So hopefully uh, you can see my screen. You should now see a web application with policy manager at the top left. And we're going to be working in a, a variety of different tabs here for the rest of the demo. We have about a half an hour left and we have loads to cover. Um, so you know, we are gonna go at a brisk pace, but please continue to ask questions to make sure that um, you, know, you walk away with full understanding of um, everything that you've seen today. So um, with that, I'd love to um, introduce Policy Manager. That's exactly what you're looking at over here. This is one of the key components that I showed earlier in the slides. Policy Manager is a runtime register repository. It is built from the ground up to anticipate all the needs of a runtime. So it's very, very smart about real bits and bytes that happen out on the network. It's very smart about security, about monitoring, about network and transports, about SOAP and REST and JSON, all the technical stuff that you need to care about where the rubber meets the road, policy manager already knows and cares about. So it's your, it's your friend. It's also a great place to have the full community of SOA uh, stakeholders log in and, and model their services and work with other folks and consume services and so on. And um, essentially, policy manager is broken into an organization tree. You can see that on the top left over here. And within the organization tree, you have a nested series of organizations. You can imagine yourselves breaking this up into your own organizations. Maybe you have a top level uh, ACME you know, enterprises. And inside of ACME, you have a legal department and a manufacturing department, an enterprise IT department, and a you know, fulfillment department, whatever it may be. All the different folks that are stakeholders in your SOA will have a home in policy manager. And essentially what I want to do today is make believe that the organization that we are today is an organization called SOA Bank. So you can see that over here. So SOA Bank is a, um, a um, multinational, uh, very large financial services organization, and it has a very large IBM infrastructure. It has IBM mainframes and Webster MQ messaging infrastructure and loads of, uh, of, uh, IBM of uh, Webster application server and uh, IBM integ integration bus. So it's got a very rich IBM infrastructure and what its challenge is, is the um, IT leader at SOA Bank worked with the business to realize that one of the top priorities for 2014 is to make sense of all that rich infrastructure, turn it into infrastructure that can produce services very, very easily, but also turn it into an infrastructure that can be very easily consumed. So today what I want to um, focus on is how can we make SOA Bank successful by first turning their infrastructure into a very uh, well-managed uh, SOA environment and then how can we also expose that out to a mobile community of app developers and cloud developers and even internal developers and make it very easy? And how can we do that using the data power platform? So let me just quickly introduce uh, Policy Manager. So essentially, every organization has a series of different um, uh, categories where you put objects. You have things like containers, policies, contracts, and services. If we start down with containers, containers is where you're going to store all of your uh, metadata about your data power infrastructure. So you can store uh, clusters of data power appliances. So here's an example over here. I have a data power cluster that's made up of two data power appliances, prod one and prod two. And inside of each of these nodes, I can put information about things like front side handlers, HTTP transport, HTTPS transport, web through MQ, and so on. And I can make this the home where I can actually deploy services. So containers is a very first key topic for Policy Manager, and it doesn't matter whether you have 10 appliances or 50 or 100, no matter how large your infrastructure, you will find a home here, and you can actually assign uh, a, uh, data power appliances and domains to different organizations. So you can give three appliances to the finance department and two appliances to the manufacturing department and 10 appliances to the fulfillment, whatever it is that's needed in order for those IT groups to come out with and manage their API and SOA services. So that's the container view. The next view I wanted to show is policies. 
So as the name implies, policy manager is very good with um, managing policy. Policy is what affects behaviors on data power. So you can define things around security, around monitoring, around mediation, transformation, all sorts of different things you can define using policy, and you can share that policy and you can make it available to a very large audience of data power uh, developers who need to come out with those great data power services. Today we're going to be working with a particular set of policy. You can see it right here. And I'll go into a little bit more detail over time about exactly what these are and how they work. But policy is a very key, very powerful aspect of our solution. Next category I wanted to show is contracts. Contracts is a way to ensure that uh, you can build a community of providers and consumers and that they have the right relationships with each other. So essentially, a contract will allow a certain part of your user community, your, your consumer community, to access service operations running on data power and running in your back end. And we do it all in a fully automated fashion. Once you define a contract, data power will automatically enforce that contract and ensure that only the right folks have the right access. So obviously, security and controlling you know, who has access to what is very key. We uh, offer that through our contract support, which is fully automated with data power. Last piece is services. Services is where this all comes together. And essentially, every service that you need to expose, maybe it's an account balance service, maybe it's a purchase order service, whatever it is, you define it here, and you model it here, and we automatically deploy that service and all of its policy, all of its contracts, and everything that's needed to make that service work we deploy it out to the data park cluster, and that's exactly what we're going to see today. Okay, So hopefully that gives you a good idea about all the different uh, key objects. Uh, at least this is enough objects that, uh, for us to actually get some really good use cases running. With that, let me actually show you what we've put together for SOA Bank to make them successful. What we started with is what we call a physical service. A physical service is a backend, and we're calling this our SOA Bank Services Backend. You could think of this as being a Web3 application server, or maybe a different application server, or maybe a mainframe. Whatever the back end is, this is our physical service that represents it, and it has an address and a place that you can go to, and it enables you to, um, uh, this, these are the existing data and applications that make up your business. But the big question is, is how do we actually produce services that can actually consume your back end? And we do that using a technique called virtualization. And with virtualization, we can actually take something like this SOA bank back end and we can virtualize it and we can deploy it to data power. So data power is a place where virtual services can run. Those virtual services will do all the important stuff we've been talking about. It will do the security, monitoring, clustering, rate limiting, exposing out to mobile devices and so on. And we're going to see all of that and more uh, on today's demo. And we did that right over here with this SOA bank services underscore SOAP. Okay, so essentially I created a virtual service that virtualized my back end and I deployed it to data power and I used policy and contracts to control the behavior on data power. And you can actually see what I've done here. I went to the operational side of my policy and I was able to attach whatever policy I wanted to. In this case, I put some security policy so data power can have security. I put HTTPS username token security policy also put a little bit of mediation because as it turns out, my backend happens to be a Microsoft-based backend, it's a WCF-based service, and it had a certain number of requirements that data power needed to fulfill in terms of setting up the message for success. I also put something called detailed auditing that allowed me to add monitoring to data power. And it's very, very easy to attach policy to a service. All I need to do is click on this manage link right here, and that pops up a small um, wizard that I can use to go and browse all the policy available in Policy Manager, or at least available to me from a security standpoint, and I can actually just check a box to say I, I want it or I don't want it. But right now, I'm saying I want this auditing orchestration or I want this username token. It's extremely easy. It also makes it easy to share. I can create a policy once, and I can have an expert do that, and then I can take that policy and attach it to one or five or 10 or 1,000 data power services, and all of those services will automatically get that policy. So policy is a very, very rich, powerful, and scalable way to get all the right behaviors onto your data power services. Okay? From a contract standpoint, I also provisioned a contract that I called SOA Bank ASP.NET contract. And I called it ASP.NET because the front-end application that we're going to work with uh, to start with is an ASP.NET application. Now, you didn't have to call it this. You could have called it whatever you wanted to. But if I click in here and take a look at this contract, you can actually see the details. The details say that this contract has a certain contract scope that includes my SOAP service, my data power service, right? And it also has a number of different um, consumer identities. In this case, it's SOA Bank user one who can actually access it. It has some more stuff lower down that we won't get into now for, because we don't have time. 
but you can see some of the key things that make up a contract. And contracts are all workflow driven, very easy to manage through our full lifecycle uh, process. So you can come out with just the right number of contracts that are needed in order to support your use cases and to let your consumers in. You can also change it over time, very, very easy. You could have easily added more folks to this contract, or added new contracts, added new services, removed services, all very easy, all done through Policy Manager, and all automatically deployed to Data Power. Okay? So that's my contract, and essentially Data Power is going to make sure that a contract is always available for all transactions that go through Data Power. Okay? So those are some key aspects. The last thing I wanted to show you is where the service is actually deployed to. So I'm going to go back down to my Data Power cluster, and I'm going to click on this tab in the top right here called Hosted Services. Hosted services shows me all the different services that are deployed to this cluster. And as you can see, indeed, my SOA Bank services, SOAP service, is indeed deployed to Data Power, which means that Data Power should be available to start uh, accepting traffic for this particular service. You can see I have some other services here as well. We'll ignore those for the moment and come back. But you can definitely, um, we're definitely going to, go, going to go into that in more detail. Okay? So hopefully that paints a nice picture about how you use Policy Manager to make all this work. Everything I've shown you today, I've put together in perhaps 10 minutes. Very, very simple. It's all done inside Policy Manager. It's all declarative. You didn't have to understand all the implementation details. We took care of making sure that everything you've defined in your Policy Manager model correctly found its way to Data Power, and Data Power is going to correctly implement everything we've just said. And obviously, this is just a small part of everything we can do. We're actually going to see more functionality over time. Okay? So before we actually go in and start seeing the service work, the last thing I wanted to show you were the operations that make up the service. So because this is SOA Bank, you can imagine the type of operations that SOA Bank wants to expose, deposit, get account balance, get transaction history, and withdraw. These are the main things that the ASP.NET application needs in order to expose to the world. But you can also imagine that these are operations that a lot of folks would want to need. Um, but basically, deposit, get account balance, get transaction history, and withdraw are the key things that Data Power is exposing in this service. And by the way, as the name implies, this is a SOAP service. And this is using WS security for its security. It's using a username token for its security. Okay? And the last thing I wanted to show is the access point, where it's actually located. You can actually see the detail right over here. It's um, over HTTPS, and we fully deployed everything to data power that's needed, including our X509 certificates that are needed for HTTPS. And you can see where it's located. It's on a host called DPO5, which is one of the uh, data power appliances inside of SOA Software, well, I should say SOA Bank's lab. I guess it's really SOA Software's lab, but DPO5 is our appliance. It's port 14443, and you can see the URL over here. Okay? So it kind of gives you an idea of all the different aspects of this service in order to make it work. With all that said, why don't we actually go and see whether or not this uh, application is available and ready to go. Yeah, was there a question? Okay, so um, this is the SOA Bank Premier ASP.NET web application. This could be used by internal call center staff. This could be used by uh, SOA Bank customers. This is essentially a front end to that rich back end that SOA Bank needed to expose. And you can see we have the four different operations here, get balance, deposit, withdraw, and history. So what I want to do is I want to go to the get balance screen, and I actually want to do some transactions. Let's make believe that I am an SOA Bank customer and I want to start doing some transactions. So we'll start with get balance. And you'll notice that this URL is the same as what we saw in Policy Manager, DPO5 on port 14443. So essentially, this ASP.NET application is going to go hit Data Power, and Data Power is going to process that message and route it to the back end and then um, get the result and give it back. And we're going to input an account ID. We're also going to input a SOA Bank user. So I'm going to click on this get balance link, and we're going to see the result. Okay. So we got back an answer. My balance is currently zero, but this is good. This means that we have connectivity to Data Power, and Data Power is receiving the message. What I want to do is actually um, get some uh, money into this bank. So I'm going to do into my bank account. So I'm going to do a deposit. Why don't we start off with, um, I don't know, we'll start off with $356.21, and we'll say that I'm depositing this for my paycheck. Okay, and let me click deposit. And there you go. I've just deposited. So that's another transaction with Data Power. Let's also do a withdrawal. Why don't we withdraw $432.56? And let's say this is for my taxes, being a tax season here in the U.S. Going to the same address as before, same user, and let's withdraw some money. Okay. And let's finally do a history. Click Get History, and there you have it. Paycheck, my taxes, 
And if I go back to get balance, I should now have a nice balance. Actually, negative balance, that's what the, uh, the tax man does to you. So we have a negative balance now, but essentially we have a bunch of transactions going through. And what we want to ask is what kind of features do we have available now that we have this data power service fully working? First thing I want to do is just quickly point out where this data power service is running. I'm going to switch over to my uh, data power admin console, and I'm going to, you can see we're on DP05 over here, same address. If I click on my web service proxy, I can actually see the different web service proxies that are deployed, and we should see my service, and indeed we do. So this is literally the service that we just hit by the ASP.NET application to do its thing. And the big question is, is what things can it do? Well, let's go back to Policy Manager, and let's go to the Monitoring tab. And first thing we're going to do is go to something called Real-Time Charts. And I'm going to take a look at what's available to me. You can see I'm getting some data for my real-time charts based upon these transactions. So the first thing we're doing is we're monitoring this service, and we're showing you exactly what type of traffic is flowing through data power. Something else that we're doing is we're actually cap capturing real live transaction logs. And you can see here that just from a couple of minutes ago, we were actually uh, driving real traffic through, deposit, withdrawal, get transaction, history, and balance. And if I double click on any of these, I can actually see all the details, okay? And I can see things like which user went through data power, uh, where did it come into? Where did it go to? What was its message size? This is all being sourced dynamically and live from data power. If I go to my recorded messages, I can actually see my live data power messages, and you can see things like uh, the security header, and you can see in the response things like my transaction history. So this is great. We're getting full uh, um, uh, monitoring of our data power services. Let's also talk a little bit about security. So I go back to my application, and I use user2 and I send the transaction through, you should see that it will fail. So data power doesn't like user two, cannot authenticate user two, so that piece is not going to work. Um, so essentially the security is working, and of course contract is working as well. If you don't have the right contract, that will not work either. If I go back to my service and I look at my um, contract view, I can actually point out that I have user one and user two. So actually even if data power can um, authenticate user two, it will fail because contract authorization will fail. Let me just quickly show that to you. Go back to my monitoring tab and go to my alerts. I sh actually, I, I think I can see it over here. Like, if you can see now it's rejected, if I double click and look at details, you can see here that it's giving a AAA authorization failure. This is because the contract authorization is failing. Okay, so we have full security in this use case. Okay, so, so far so good. We're doing very well. This was all fully automated. We deployed this service to data power and we have all these great benefits in terms of security and monitoring and all the policy that we've attached to the service. Why don't we keep going and ask a different question for a moment. Let's ask, what if we had to do other integration with the larger uh, SOA bank infrastructure? What if, for example, we needed to do Web3MQ? And why don't we say that the SOA bank has a um, requirement that all withdrawals get monitored? Because withdrawals are very important because that shows money flows coming out of SOA bank. What if we needed to monitor all of those? And what if I needed to attach to a, an existing sophisticated Web3MQ environment that received all those using asynchronous messaging? Answer, no problem. We can absolutely uh, automate that for SOA Bank. Let me show you how we can do that. If I go to my uh, cluster of data power appliances, you can see that I have a new um, uh, listener here. It's a Web3MQ listener. So Policy Manager supports Web3MQ out of box, as does data power. So you can easily build Web3MQ solutions on top of this platform. Let me quickly show you how we were able to implement this for the bank. We went down to the operation level. And remember, it was only withdrawals that we needed to audit. So we went in there, and we chose the withdrawal operation. And in there, we decided to add an orchestration. So we support orchestration out of box for ESB-type functionality. The orchestration is fairly simple, but you can see exactly what it's doing over here. It receives the message, and then it puts the message on a uh, web server MQ queue before it actually uh, calls the back end. Okay, so essentially all the different withdrawals are going to go through this orchestration and going to result on um, puts to web server MQ. But that's not quite the end. We, what we also did is we created another service that we deployed to DataPower, which is this auditing processor service. And this auditing processing service is going to take that uh, withdrawal message off of the queue and it's going to monitor it, and it's going to drive it to a final queue that's going to do that final work, okay? So essentially, our core service that we've been exposing to ASP.NET has an orchestration that's going to put withdrawal messages onto a queue, 
and then another data power service is going to take it off the queue, do some interesting monitoring, and then put it on a final queue. Okay? All done through Policy Manager, all fully modeled using the tool set here. Let's actually see this in action. So what I want to do is I want to go back, and I want to go to my withdrawal. Okay? And let's do something else here for my withdrawal. Let's do $245.54. And let's say more taxes. And will this be W will this be WMQ audited? Okay? So let's put this withdrawal through. Okay? And the withdrawal went through. If we check our history, we should actually be able to see there it is, more taxes, and will this be WMQ audited? But let's ask ourselves if the orchestration actually worked. If I go back to my processor and I go to my monitoring tab, okay, I can actually see that it is picking up messages from MQ and processing them. And if I actually go, and you can see obviously it's always withdraw. Okay? And if I actually go inside and look at this, I can actually see where the message came from, which you can recognize as an MQ uh, URL that's going to a queue manager on data power. And you can see where it's going to, another queue. So essentially it's the audit intermediate queue going to the audit final queue, okay? And we've decided to audit these messages here as well. So you can actually see the message, more taxes, will this be MQ audited? And let's also check our MQ infrastructure to see if MQ was able to actually put this through as well. So I'm going to switch over to my MQ Explorer running on my MQ server, and I should be able to go to my final queue. Let me go and browse messages. Okay. And you can see I have a message from uh, just a couple of minutes ago. Okay, so if I go in, I'm sorry, right, right over here. If I go in here and I um, view the content and actually look at the payload of this MQ final destination, you can actually see that this is the message that came through. So more taxes, will this WMQ uh, be audited? Okay, so we're able to implement a full MQ solution using the uh, tool set and using data power. So it's very, very exciting in terms of integrating with an MQ environment, okay? So um, let's keep going with that. One last thing I wanted to show, and then we're going to switch gears onto um, API. What I wanted to show here is a last piece around being able to do some customized work. So supposing that, I mean, everything we've seen so far is all out of box. You'll be able to implement everything we've seen using the full power of the SOA software suite and data power. What if you guys needed to do your own sophisticated things on the data power platform? We offer a very, very powerful feature called um, custom policy. It allows you to extend data power in any way you like, but to still do it in a fully automated fashion. If I um, go to my policy section, I'll show you a new policy here called my SOA Bank Withdrawal Alerting Policy. Okay? And in this policy, this is again all custom, and essentially it's related to withdrawals, just like the MQ solution. The bank said that any time any uh, withdrawal is made for $500 or more, they want that audited because they want, to, they want alerts raised for certain types of money flows coming out of the bank. And they want this message to happen. A withdrawal has gone above the threshold. So in order to implement this, again, this is fully custom. This is not out of box. This is very special to SOA Bank. We were able to implement this using policy managers' full policy management tools, and we were able to deploy the right implementation on data power so that data power could correctly do that. In order to make this work, all we had to do is attach this policy to our service. So let me quickly go back to the Operations tab. And again, we're going to go back to Withdrawal because that's where the key piece is. And once again, I have my alerting policy attached. And again, only for this operation. So why don't we try this out? Again, the alerting policy says that anything over $500 should result in an alert and should have this message over here. So let me quickly go back to ASP.NET and do another Withdrawal. And why don't we do $501.54? And why don't we say this is for my vacation? Okay. And let's send this across. And there you go. $501. And you can see it in the history as well. Okay. So we're doing pretty good. Okay. So I'm sorry, doing pretty good down here. But did Data Power enforce this policy and drive an alert? Why don't we go find out? I'm going to go back to my service, I'm going to go back to monitoring, and I'm going to go to my alerts now. This is all fully integrated. I'm going to double click on my top alert. Okay. And there you go. A withdrawal has gone above the threshold. The withdrawal was $501. The threshold was $500. Okay. So we were able to offer the bank a fully automated but fully custom solution as well for their very specific needs around things like um, withdrawal alerting. But you can imagine the sky is the limit here. You can implement any type of solution you want. Okay. 
one last thing I wanted to show here is I wanted to show the actual modification of this policy and show you how easy it is to change something in order that you can um, see an effect on data power. Let's say we want to uh, change the message and change it to, um, let's say, let's say too much, there you go, that's good. Too much money is falling out of the bank. Probably not a, the, the best message, but we'll do it just to show a change. And let's change the withdrawal amount, make it 1500, okay? So I'm gonna change my policy, I'm gonna click apply, okay? And what I wanted to demonstrate here is how easy it is once you change policy for data power to be updated with that new policy. And we do that through deployment. So you didn't get a chance to see deployments earlier, so I wanted to quickly show that now. We can switch over to another um, view that actually can show us the things that are going on inside of um, data power. Essentially, this screen here is an administration screen that shows you all the deployments that we're making to data power to make this whole SOA and API program actually work. And you can see here that because we made a change to policy, we have two services that are requesting deployment to data power. We're not actually deploying because we have full control. We're actually saying, don't deploy now, stopped, but we can deploy it if we want to. And we have a full cluster here, both our first data power appliance and our second. And you can see that they're both automatically waiting for this update because we made a change to that policy. So let's say that we're ready. And all I want to do is I want to start my queue for my first appliance and start my queue on my second appliance, and that should start the deployment to data power with this new policy. So you can see that we're in the middle of deploying now, first to the first appliance, and then we are now applying to deploying to my, the second. Let's give that a moment to, to complete. And you can see, by the way, that it's deploying to, we didn't talk about the API yet, we're gonna talk about that in just a second, but the reason why it's deploying to is because two services, an API and an internal service, both rely on this policy, so we need to deploy both of these um, together, okay? So let's just give that a bit for it to um, deploy to data power. And essentially, uh, this screen is used to control all of those critical deployments that you have control as to exactly when they happen. So you can see that our first API was deployed, it took about 35 seconds. Let's give it just a bit for the second one to be deployed. If we switch over to our second appliance, you can see it's also finished the first one and is starting on the second one. You can also see, by the way, there's a full history of everything that's been deployed in the past, so you have a nice way to understand exactly what's running on data power, okay? Let's just let this one finish, and you can see it's now done, okay? Now that it's done, I should be able to hit data power with the very same ASP.NET app, and I should see the new policy enforced. Let me go back and see. Let's do a withdrawal again, and let's make, again, this has to be over 1,500, so let's make this 1,601 and 56 cents, and let's say this is more, more taxes, okay? And I go through my withdrawal, and there you go, 1601. I go to my history, and I can see my history down here, more taxes, 1601. Let's see if data power is enforcing the new policy. I go back to my service and policy manager, click on alerts, click on my top alert here, and there you go. Too much money is flowing out of the bank, 1601 versus 1500. So what I wanted to demonstrate here is you're going to gain a lot of agility across your entire data power infrastructure. No matter how many APIs and SOA services you have, we make it very easy for you to make whatever changes you need to make, even if it's very custom to your environment, okay? One last thing I wanted to show, and then we'll move on, is the cluster feature. I've been showing you clusters all over the place here. I've shown you clusters down at the container view. I showed you clustering down at the deployment view where we had two different here. Let me just actually show you the cluster running. This whole time we've been going to 14.443 but our second data power appliance is on 15.443. Let's just see that the second cluster is still working. I do a get history, or I can do a get balance. Okay, and there you have it. Okay, so um, the full cluster is working, and they're working identically. Everything we've put in, the custom policy, the HTTPS, any kind of mediation, transformation, orchestration, so on, is all working seamlessly across the entire cluster. It doesn't matter how big the cluster is. Two appliances here, you could have four, eight, 12, it doesn't really matter, okay? So clustering is a very important concept here. We make it easy, okay? So with that, what I wanted to do is switch gears. I know that we're running a bit late. We're basically at the top of the hour. Um, if you need to drop off, then um, please do. But if you can stay, really appreciate a little bit of extra time. I would say in another five to 10 minutes, we'll be able to cover the other side of the coin, the, um, from convergence, the API, so we're going to switch gears now uh, and talk about that and then close for Q&A. So definitely appreciate your, your, your patience here. But if you do need to drop off, then we, then we definitely understand, okay? So the last piece I wanted to show is around API and convergence. So far, everything we've been talking about 
is really all about the production side if you think about it. We're taking a complex MQ infrastructure, Microsoft infrastructure, could be integration bus infrastructure, and we're using things like security and policy and orchestration, mediation, transformation, and so on, in order to make that a very nice service-oriented architecture. You can imagine that you would have many services here, not just my SOAP service and my MQ service, but all kinds of services, all very neatly represented. The big question now, and this is the whole point of convergence, is how do you also make progress on the API side of the coin? How do you build a developer community? How do you expose REST services as APIs? How do you work with OAuth and basic auth and all the things that are needed in the new mobile world, the new mobile revolution, the cloud world, all those important facts, how do you market and make available and have a clear business performance goals for the exposure of your data to a very large community? And the answer is you do that with data power in the very same way that you're doing it here, utilizing SOA software. And with that, I want to introduce a second tool, which is our community manager developer portal, which is the view that you're looking at right here. And the developer portal is built on top of our full tool set. So it's not a separate application. Uh, everything about it uh, works with everything that we've talked about so far, and it's actually intrinsic to everything we've talked about so far. So all the definitions of everything you've done, all the policy, the security, uh, all the life cycle, all the deployments, it's all fully enabled through Community Manager as well. Let me actually show you how this works and to, to kind of prove that. I'm going to switch to a different part of my organization tree, and inside of that, I'm going to show you how we can deploy an API to data power using a very similar tool set, but within a very rich API environment. The API we're going to look at is right here, SOA Bank Services API. As you can see over here, it has the same operations, deposit, get balance, transaction history, and withdraw, but it's a bit different. This is a fully REST-enabled service. This is using basic auth, and this is using all the built-in features of Community Manager. Let me actually show you that. If I switch over to our Community Manager tool and click on the API icon, you can see it's right here. So this very same API that we just saw here in Policy Manager, and that we can map model using all the sophisticated stuff we took a look at, MQ, and all the different types of security and the custom policy and so on, is now available here so that a mobile community, a app community, an API developer community can all work together and be successful. And we're actually managing in Community Manager both APIs and apps. So let me first click on the API. When I click on the API, you can see a lot of different things that you can do here. You can definitely do monitoring, similar to what we saw earlier, but you also have things like message boards. You also have documentation. You also have um, legal. If I look at, for example, documentation, we're automatically allowing you to document all the different operations and how do you use them so that you can make it very nice and easy for a large community. So you can see here things like the withdrawal, deposit, history, and balance. Okay, and you can even modify this, and I can add new new content here on the fly. Um, so you can do lots of interesting things in terms of documentation. Um, also, we're going to help to manage the full app environments. When I click on apps over here, I can see all the different apps that want to consume this. Because one of the key use cases of Community Manager is to open up your enterprise data to a very large community of folks who can browse all of your data that's running on data power and running in your IBM backend and can actually start consuming it. This SOA Bank mobile app is an example of one such uh, consumer, one such app, where an app developer said, I really love those SOA Bank APIs, I want to use them. And through all automated functionality, we were able to grant access and we were able to tell Data Power to automatically let any SOA Bank mobile app user access Data Power, whereas other apps do not have that access. Okay? And you can see that inside of this app, if I click on it, there are a variety of things that this app can do. And so essentially, Community Manager is helping two different types of users. It's helping app developers build their apps against APIs and it's helping API developers market and make available everything that's needed in order to drive the consumption side of the equation. But remember, all of this is on data power. All of this is utilizing data power's full feature set. Okay? So with all that in place, why don't we actually see this um, API in action? So to do that, I'm going to switch gears. We're not going to use the ASP.NET app. We're actually going to use a um, mobile app uh, because that's pretty fitting for an API-based scenario. So you can see over here, this is my mobile app. This is a, um, a, an emulator. And I actually have this app running in Community Manager inside of my mobile device. So I'm going to go and actually use this. So we're calling it the SOA Bank phone app. Okay. It's going to ask me to log in. I'm going to put the very same account number that I put in ASP.NET application. One, two, three, 
four, and five. And why don't we log in? And everything that we're doing here, again, is against data power, the very same data power appliance that we were working with earlier. Why don't we start off with a get, about, get balance request? And you can see we're already getting our data back. Why don't we go to our transaction history and see if we can see a similar transaction history as before? And there you go. More taxes, my vacation, will this BMQ audited, taxes from my paycheck. So this is not the same service as the ASP.NET. It's a virtual service that has different behavior because it's uh, uh, suited for an API world, but it's going against the very same back end and it's doing the very same great stuff that we did before. And indeed, it's even doing the withdrawal monitoring that we talked about. Let me just quickly show this to you. When I click on withdrawal, you can see that it has the alerting policy. So what that means is that if I actually go in to my um, app and I do a withdrawal over 1,500, I should hopefully see an alert. So let's actually do a withdrawal. And let's say this amount is for $3,563, let's say. And let's say this is even more taxes. A lot of taxes this tax season. Let's actually make this, make this quick, <laughs> even taxes. So with, let's withdraw this very large amount, and let's see if Data Power is able to correctly do that. Let's go back to transaction history. There you go, even taxes for 30, 3563 Let's go back to Data Power, and let's go to our container view and look at our alerts. I go to monitoring, and I go to details, and sorry, go to monitoring. Okay, and there you go. Too much money is flowing out, 3563 1500 this is one of my favorite use cases because it's showing you that whether it's a mobile app consuming Stella Bank's infrastructure or an internal app, it's the exact same policy, exact same data power appliance, exact same behavior. This is extremely powerful. This allows you to have a single unified solution that can handle all your needs, whether it's API or SOA-based services. Let me just show you something else inside of Community Manager. If I go back to my API and I look at the monitoring section, I can actually see this monitoring functionality flowing through. I get a nice breakdown of the different operations, get transaction history, deposit, withdraw, and so on. I can even see full logs of stuff coming through data power. If I go to the top one, you can see uh, uh, under info that this is my get transaction history. That was the last piece. You can see the flow here. Uh, you can see the URL, which is a REST-based URL for transaction history, a little bit different than SOAP. If you look at the response, for example, you can even see the body, right? Same thing. All of this is being driven. By the way, this service is also doing full REST to SOAP mediation because it's the same back end, remember, same WCF back end using SOAP. So we have full mediation in place to make all of this work. So we have a very nice story for REST-based services, okay? So the idea here is, you know, we don't have time to cover all the features of Community Manager, but the idea here is that you'll be able to use full API management functionality over the same data power infrastructure, same back end infrastructure that you're already uh, using today and you can leverage all the power of data power, okay? So hopefully that gives you an idea, and hopefully that's a very relevant use case for you. I'm sure that you have a lot of existing infrastructure you're already exposing, but you'd like to further manage it. You'd also like to further make it available to an API world, but you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want new uh, gateways. You don't want new types of policies or applications or runtime infrastructures. You want a single unified solution for everything that you need to do. So hopefully this is a very convincing, very compelling solution. It's going to give you everything that you need to do, and hopefully this makes sense in terms of that earlier slide we showed where data power is in the center of all of this, giving you everything that you need, whether it's lifecycle management, whether it's SOA, whether it's API, whether it's consumption or production. Everything that you need to solve all your problems can be answered in a single um, unified solution. So um, we are a bit over, and, and I promised to, to make sure we had some time for Q&A. So I think the best thing to do here is to, to, uh, to, um, to close out the discussion with Q&A and, and, and thoughts, um, and then we'll take things from there. So um, with that, um, any thoughts or questions? Um, there are some questions in the chat box. There sure are. Um, let me go to the chat box, and we're going to cycle through um, the different questions. Um, Wow, a lot of questions. Just give me a moment here to get to the top. Okay, here we go. So first question is, is, is there a way to place services in different categories to navigate large number of services? Great, great question. These are really, really good, good, good questions, by the way. Thank you, everyone, for, for being so alert here with all these great questions. So um, a way to place services in different categories, absolutely. 
Um, you know, in one hour, we can't really show everything that we do, but we do a huge amount across both the SOA and API landscape. We have very sophisticated tools for categorization and tagging and ownership and, and putting services in, in the right organization. We're extremely uh, scalable. It doesn't really matter how many services you have. You could have 50, 500, 10,000. We have ways to manage that. We have customers managing extremely large numbers of services across a very large data power infrastructure. So we can absolutely help you with all the right tools to make that work. Okay, it's a really, really good question. Um, next question, uh, I probably missed it. So data power is an on-premise, within the firewall, efficient manager and integrator of API and SOA. So I guess that's more of a, a summary. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, data power is going to be the centerpiece of your API and SOA solution, but it's going to be fully managed, fully automated in a full lifecycle environment where all your stakeholders can participate, uh, all in a uh, very, very nice, uh, very comprehensive tool set. So yes, absolutely, um, data power uh, is on-premise and it is the centerpiece for your API and SOA functionality. Um, next next uh, piece is would you share links in IBM.com uh, for us to learn more? Please do share answers, other questions, and so on. Um, so definitely I'm going to give a slide on um, places you can visit on SOA.com where you can definitely learn more about the different aspects um, of, uh, of SOA.com uh, with some great links as well. Um, next question, can you limit the number of requests that are forwarded to backend services at a time while queuing exceedance requests? Answer is absolutely. Data Power has very, very rich support for that using things like uh, service level monitoring support, and we fully automate that. So you can take a service and you can say it can only utilize 100 transactions per second. Anything more than that, Data Power will automatically uh, start shaping that traffic and limiting who can actually do it. So we have very nice support for that. Data Power has very nice support for that. We could even target it down to an operation level. You can have different levels of, of, uh, of rate limiting for different operations. So very, very powerful. Okay. Next question, uh, way to place different services and categories for a large number of services. I think we addressed that already. Um, next one is API management support and SOA software available from some specific version of SOA software policy manager. So, I mean, typically it's the latest version of policy manager. Uh, we'll support earlier versions as well. Uh, but essentially, um, its it, it support is for our core policy manager offering. So good question there. Next question, I presume the policy manager functionality is available both with embedded and standalone management points. That's a really good question. That question is around something we didn't discuss. We offer uh, support for management of not just data power. But the answer is yes. Um, no matter where your API and SOA services are running, we're going to be able to help you to ensure that you have full management uh, across your infrastructure. And so we have really nice support for IBM support from Microsoft and, and, and other platforms, so we can definitely help you throughout your entire environment, okay? Next question, how do I ensure last mile security, uh, considering embedded MP cannot be installed? Another great question, so last mile security is a, is a topic of how do we make sure that uh, wherever data power forwards messages to in the back end, that that guy is fully secured? So a lot of different techniques. Um, why don't you contact us and we can go into a you know, deeper conversation about that. You could put management points uh, in your back end. You could also do things like um, SSL, and other types of security. So there are different ways of doing that, and we can definitely chat more about that offline. Next question, how much of it is configuration as opposed to coding when using API management? Love that question. Favorite question of the day, I think, um, because the answer is really nice. There's no coding. Everything that you've seen here is fully out of box, with the exception of the custom policy, because obviously custom policy is custom, and even that can be done without coding, but it can be done with like XSLT and so on. So great, great question. This is not a large-scale integration or coding effort. Everything you see in today and more into the future is all fully enabled without code using simple modeling inside of our tool set. So really, really good question. That's a very important takeaway. This is all out of box. This is not something that's going to take you six months to put together. You're going to put this together very, very quickly using out-of-box tooling. Okay. Next question, is there a trial version of the software? Um, what I would say is contact us. I'll have a contact slide in just a second, and uh, we'll share with you more about how you can get involved and start looking at the um, technology. Next question, does PM for Data Power automate or manage Data Power SSL profile? Another really good question. It's a simple answer across the board. We automate everything. So everything you've seen today, from SSL and X509 to WS security to contract authorization to authentication to transformation, everything you've seen today is fully automated. You don't have to go and provision these things on your own on data power. We make sure that all that gets to where it needs to go across an entire cluster. So really, really good question. That's again, the key pillar of our approach to data power is full automation of everything, API and SOA, doesn't matter if it's MQ, Web3 Application Server, 
doesn't matter uh, how large and rich your environment is, we're going to automate it all for you. So really, really good question. Okay. Um, next one is, um, would it be uh, SOA software specific product built on top of IBM data power? Is it just all IBM data power? So the, the runtime, the actual gateway, is full data power. Same great data power you know today. The management tooling that's making all this happen in terms of the API and the SOA and the monitoring and the, and the community, the developer portal, that's provided by SOA software. So essentially, this solution is a partnership between IBM and SOA software that's making all these different things working. Next question, are you deploying to instances versus deploying to cluster? Um, so again, it's across the entire cluster. If you have two data power nodes in your cluster, we deploy to two. If it's four, it goes to four. We make sure that whatever your cluster environment looks like, we will fully deploy uh, to that cluster very, very quickly in as little as 15 seconds per service. Next question is, will you publish a recording of the presentation? The answer is absolutely. We'll make this available for you guys. Next question is, are you deploying to instances versus to a cluster? Um, to a cluster. Um, remember, when we saw that admin screen, we deployed the changes to that auditing policy to both nodes, not just one. So we're fully cluster aware on data power. Doesn't matter how big your cluster is, fully uh, integrated with clustering and automated. Um, next question, does SOA software have an embedded MQ client? Good question. The answer is, is we make use of data power's MQ feature and functionality. So it's data power's rich MQ support that is being used and is what you saw live here today in terms of MQ integration, okay? Next question, can we change the UI of community manager? That's a great question, absolutely. What I showed you is just an out of box. Um, SOA Bank would really have a fully branded um, and, and experience and environment. Um, I didn't show that today, but in your case, you can imagine that it is fully branded and you can um, add even new types of screens and so on. So community manager is extremely flexible to make sure that your community and your portal um, is very, very nicely branded and targeted to the community that you're trying to target. It's a really, really nice question. Uh, next question, where are monitoring logs stored and for how long? Uh, great question, and stored in a relational database uh, like, such as Oracle or SQL Server, which means that you have full access to it and you can actually do as you need. In terms of how long is it stored, again, that's up to your DBAs. If you guys have a policy that you need to uh, move them off every day, it's every day. If it's every six months, it's six months. If you want to warehouse the, those uh, usage data, you can do that as well. So because it's standard relational technology, you can do what you will uh, with your DBAs to make sure you have the right solution uh, for the storage of important data that, that you have. Next question, how do we separate corporate administrator tasks and department level admins, policy level deployments? Another great question. Policy manager and our tooling is fully uh, um, secured in a very rich user model that lets you break down your SOA into different uh, responsibilities. Different users will be able to use different things. We support all sorts of different types of roles, trading partner roles and end user roles and um, mobile app developer roles and uh, internal administrators versus business managers. We support the entire spectrum of different user types and we let you delegate administration. So you can actually come out with a finance department and have a finance IT lead and say that finance IT lead uh, has ownership over the finance IT department. They're the ones that have control over what services get created, where they get deployed to, in which data power infrastructure, and so on. So yes, you have full, full control over the entire um, uh, process, the full life cycle of services, and who does what across all of our tool set. Okay? Um, last question here. What is the support for EDI transactions with the solution? Great question. Um, again, we're using data power here as our gateway, so you're going to utilize uh, data power's capabilities. So if you're using XB62, you have a very rich solution set there. If you're using XI52, you'll be able to use some features uh, on the XI52. So again, it's very key that we don't uh, change the data power functionality. It's the same great functionality you utilize. We only automate it and uh, enhance it and make it available in a full API and SOA environment. So in terms of uh, strategic planning and architecture and thinking about all you need to do in the future, the way to think about it is simple. If data power can do it, we can help you to make that a reality in a very rich lifecycle driven environment such as what I've been showing here today. So really good question about EDI transactions. Okay, a um, lot of really, really good questions. Other thoughts and questions before we close? And you can um, chat in the window, or you can um, on the phone live. Any thoughts or questions? Okay, so I think we're done. So the final slide you see here um, uh, has some uh, contact us information. 
So you can reach out to me uh, personally if you wish, simon.barrere at soa.com. Also, please do visit us at www.soa.com slash IBM to learn more about our data power and IBM solutions. We also have some great uh, white papers and data sheets. Uh, I shared some of that earlier uh, that you definitely want to take a look at and download. So we have a lot of great stuff. Please do visit us. Please do reach out, and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Um, but uh, that's pretty much what um, we wanted to share today. So we went a bit over. We do apologize for that, but we did have a lot of content. We thank you very much for all your time. We hope that this was very compelling. We hope that this helped you to think about what convergence is and what it means and uh, what your next steps are in terms of ensuring convergence in your environment. We hope that the demo gave you a good idea of what it's like to use data power as a centerpiece of API and SOA convergence into the future and how SOA software can partner with you to offer a great fully automated solution across all of your most challenging needs. Um, so with that, I think we will close. Thank you, everyone, for all of your time. Let's keep the conversation going, and we will talk soon. Thank you. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in two.